I visited General Washington. He appeared much depressed. I observed him to play with his pen and ink upon several small pieces of paper. I was struck with the inscription. It was, Victory or Death. Dr. Benjamin Rush, Christmas Eve, 1776. As the year was ending, America's war for independence seemed doomed. George Washington had not won a battle since taking command. In the past five months, the British had driven his army all the way from Long Island to southern Pennsylvania. Washington's army had once numbered 20,000. By New Year's Day, when more enlistments would expire, it would fall below 3,000. Order your firearms. To keep the rebellion alive, Washington needed new recruits. To inspire enlistments, he needed a victory. Congress asked each of the United States to declare a day of prayer to seek God's help in defeating the British. On Christmas Eve, Washington received intelligence that seemed to answer his prayers. Across the Delaware River, the town of Trenton, New Jersey, was held by fewer than 1,500 German soldiers. The Hessian commander, Colonel Johann Rohl, was so contemptuous of the rebels, he called them country clowns. He did not even bother to fortify his outpost. Less than 10 miles from Trenton on Christmas night, George Washington launched one of the boldest maneuvers of the war. He began to ferry his ragged army across the ice-choked Delaware. Washington himself chose the password for their mission, victory or death. It was nearly 3 a.m. on December 26th before all the men were finally across. They still had nine treacherous miles to march over icy roads. It is fearfully cold and raw. It'll be a terrible night for the soldiers who have no shoes. Some of them have tied old rags around their feet. Others are barefoot. But I have not heard a man complain. Colonel John Fitzgerald. Snow and freezing rain slowed their march, stealing Washington's chance to surprise the Hessians before daylight. Still, he pressed on. I have never seen Washington so determined. A man came with a message from General Sullivan that the storm was wetting the muskets and rendering them unfit. Tell General Sullivan, said Washington, to use the bayonet. I am resolved to take Trenton. Colonel John Fitzgerald. When the Americans reached the outskirts of the silent town, only a few Hessians were standing guard. Colonel Rawl wasn't expecting an American attack on the morning after Christmas. Roused from a deep sleep, Colonel Rawl tried to form his men, but Washington's artillery cut them down. The battle had raged for less than half an hour when Rawl was shot and mortally wounded. In his pocket was a note that a loyalist had sent the night before while the colonel was playing cards and drinking wine. It warned of an American attack. Rawl never read it. Surrounded, under heavy fire, and with their leader down, three elite Hessian regiments lowered their colors in surrender. The rebels captured 900 prisoners. Not one American was killed, and only two American officers were wounded. One was George Washington's nephew, William. The other was James Monroe, future president of the United States. 
Flushed with the victory at Trenton, Washington now wanted the rest of New Jersey. The commander-in-chief rarely spoke directly to his troops, but on December 30th, 1776, he made an exception. With only 48 hours before enlistments expired, he personally promised any man who would stay a bonus of $10, more than a month's pay. Not one man stepped forward to accept. Washington made a final plea. Your country is at stake, your wives and all that you hold dear. If you will consent to stay, you will render service to the cause of liberty. This is the crisis which is to decide our destiny. Finally, one man stepped forward, and then another. In one regiment, every soldier who could still march volunteered to re-enlist. In the end, more than half of those asked agreed to stay on for six more weeks. With the onset of winter, British General Charles Lord Cornwallis had planned to return to London to see his ailing wife. But following the shocking defeat at Trenton, his leave was canceled. On New Year's Day, 1777, Cornwallis left New York and rode 50 miles to Princeton, New Jersey. The next day, with 5,500 British regulars, he marched out to crush Washington. When he arrived that night, General Cornwallis learned that the Americans were camped with their backs to the Delaware and that the river had become impassable. He pointed toward Washington's camp just half a mile away and said, we've got the old fox safe now. We'll go over and bag him in the morning. One of his officers disagreed. My lord, if Washington's the general I take him to be, and you trust these people tonight, you will see nothing of them in the morning. Through the night, the glow of American campfires assured Cornwallis that his quarry was still trapped. But the fires were a decoy. At one in the morning, the rebels had muffled their wagon wheels with rags and slipped away. The next morning, January 3rd, 1777, just outside Princeton, a British regiment marching to join Cornwallis was surprised by the vanguard of Washington's army coming out of the woods. Ah! After firing only a few volleys, the rebels turned and fled, panicked by the sight of British bayonets. Heedless of his own safety, George Washington charged directly into the fray to reform his men, just 30 paces from the British guns. When the smoke cleared, Washington was still in his saddle, and the men heard him shout, Parade with us, my brave fellows. The day is ours. Within 45 minutes, the rebels had driven the British from the field and captured Princeton. In just one week, Washington's bold winter victories in Trenton and Princeton turned the tide of the war and transformed George Washington into a legend. If there are spots on his character, they are like spots on the sun, only discernible by the magnifying powers of a telescope. Had he lived in the days of idolatry, he would have been worshipped as a god. The Pennsylvania Journal. There are two impacts from Washington's campaign of Trenton and Princeton. The first one is an immediate impact, which is morale. 
it bounces straight up. Here's an army that supposedly was down for the count, coming back off the canvas like Rocky and knocking the champ out. Obviously, everybody's going to feel good. But the more important significance for the Continental Army is the recovery of most of New Jersey as recruiting ground. An Englishman visiting America reported on the rebels' newfound strength. Volunteer companies are collecting in every county on the continent. And in a few months, the rascals will be stronger than ever. Even the parsons, some of them, have turned out as volunteers. Damn them all. In London, in the week George Washington was retaking New Jersey, a 54-year-old British general was making a confident boast. One conclusive blow, and within a year, I shall return from America victorious. General John Burgoyne. He backed his wager with a 50-guinea bet, four years' pay for a British enlisted man. Burgoyne, thought to be illegitimate and known to be ambitious, was seeking his place in British history. His plan relied on the time-honored strategy of divide and conquer. His troops would march down the Hudson River from Canada to Albany. To cut off troublemaking New England from her less rebellious neighbors, he would secure a chain of forts from the St. Lawrence all the way to the Atlantic. Burgoyne's first move in the summer of 1777 was to dispatch a diversionary force through the Mohawk Valley, home of the Iroquois Confederacy, Britain's Indian allies on the frontier. The commander of the mission, Lieutenant Colonel Barry St. Leger, had served 20 years in the Canadian wilderness. With his knowledge of the frontier, he covered an impressive 10 miles a day. On August 2nd, he arrived at Fort Schuyler, the key to the Mohawk Valley. Son Leisure had been told that Fort Schuyler was in disrepair and would be easy to take. Instead, he found it staunchly defended by 750 New York Continentals. Rather than launch an attack, Son Leisure decided to mount a siege. After three days of bombardment, the American garrison refused to surrender. By now, scouts had alerted St. Leisure that 800 Americans were marching from the east to break the siege. The American reinforcements were led by Brigadier General Nicholas Herkimer of the New York militia. When Herkimer urged caution in moving against the larger enemy force, his officers were suspicious. Herkimer's brother was fighting with St. Leger. Herkimer had no choice but to resume the march. Six miles short of Fort Schuyler, the column entered a narrow ravine near a place called Ariscone. The woods above them exploded as 400 of St. Leger's Indian allies opened fire. In the initial ambush, General Herkimer is badly wounded, but he orders himself call, uh, carried over and propped up against a tree, pulls out his pipe, and starts calmly puffing away while giving it orders to his people. It's that example of not panicking, of being calm, cool, and collected that's positive inspiration that keeps the rest of that militia force from disintegrating. They all figure, well, if the boss can do it, I can do it. But the farmers of Herkimer's brigade were no match for the warriors of Indian leader Joseph Brandt. The Indians killed one after another of the slow-loading militiamen, 
until the rebels began to fight in pairs, one loading while the other fired. One of the things that maybe is deceptive about the Battle of Oriskany leads to its reputation for it being a very bitter and bloody fight is that it was done at extremely close range rather than the, the number of killed and wounded that were involved. It's that each one of those individual incidents involved hand-to-hand -hand combat. And in the 18th century, hand-to-hand -hand combat is a relatively rare phenomenon. One side or the other will run away before you can get that close. When it was over, 160 Americans were dead. Herkimer himself later bled to death after a surgeon ineptly amputated his leg. The Indians lost several of their most important chiefs and warriors. When they returned to their camp, they discovered that the rebels from Fort Schuyler had plundered it. The British had assured their Indian allies of easy battles and the spoils of war. Now they had neither. Hundreds deserted. At Fort Schuyler, the siege was now in its second week. 100 miles away, Benedict Arnold volunteered to lead a 1,000 Continentals to rescue the garrison. But before he even reached the fort, Arnold tried a ruse to win the battle without firing a shot. Arnold is smart enough to take advantage of a gentleman named Han Yost, who is a retarded individual. But in Indian mythology, in an Indian religion, an individual for whom the spirits are speaking, he's specially blessed. So Arnold sends him on ahead of the Continental Column with the story that all the long knives are coming and this is going to be a big battle and there's a huge force approaching. Arnold's ruse worked. The rest of the Indians fled. St. Ledger, finding himself deserted by his Indians, deemed his situation so hazardous that he decamped in the greatest hurry, leaving his tents with most of his artillery in the field. Thus we have clipped the right wing of General Burgoyne. Dr. James Thatcher. Yet at that moment, Burgoyne was bearing down upon the Hudson Valley with a splendid force, still intent on winning his wager to crush the rebellion. The army embarks to approach the enemy. We are to contend for the king and vindicate the law. This army must not retreat. On June 13, 1777, General John Burgoyne began his Hudson Valley campaign. Leading a grand procession of 11,000. 2,000 were women and children. Women participated in the American Revolution as camp followers. This is a term that usually conjures up notions of prostitutes, but in fact, with both the English and the American armies, families of soldiers came into the camps and traveled with the army. Uh, wives, children, pets, chickens all arrived anywhere a major army was settled in. Armies had to allow women to come join the camps because otherwise men would desert because of the uncertainty of what was happening to their families. They were the consorts of the men, they were the nurses, they were the cooks, they provided comfort and companionship, and there were hundreds of them, both for, for common soldiers and for the officers, and their experience and their contribution to the war was a very, very important one. The Baroness Frederica Charlotte Louise von Riedersel, wife of a German general, was among them. The general himself came before his wife. She had to remain behind because she wanted to have her third child before she came. As soon as the child was born, she packed up her three little daughters between the ages of four and newborn and took a ship to Canada 
and followed her husband to the battlefield. I wrote my husband and urgently begged him to let me join him, saying that I had sufficient courage and would never complain regardless of what hardships I might have to endure. As the Baroness made her way to America, the army she was about to join reached its first objective, the great fortress of Ticonderoga. Its capture two years earlier had humiliated the British. Now Burgoyne would try to redeem his country's honor. A hill called Mount Defiance towered over the fort. It was so steep that the Americans never attempted to fortify it. But British General William Phillips saw promise in the rugged slopes of defiance. Where a goat can go, a man can go. And where a man can go, he can drag a gun. While the Americans spent an uneventful 4th of July, the British were painstakingly moving from tree to tree with block and tackle, hauling their cannon up Mount Defiance. On July 5th, the soldiers at Fort Ticonderoga awoke in the shadow of British guns. On the other side of Lake Champlain, General Friedrich von Riedesel was on his way with 3,000 men, threatening to cut off the rebels' avenue of retreat. The Americans abandoned the fort without a fight. When King George III learned that Ticonderoga was once again in British hands, he is said to have burst into his wife's dressing room and startled her ladies by shouting, I have beat them. I have beat all the Americans. In three weeks, Burgoyne had managed to cover a hundred miles. He had only 90 more to go to reach Albany. In a letter to George Washington, General Philip Schuyler despaired of stopping the invasion. Our army is weak in numbers, dispirited with little ammunition and not a single cannon. The country is in the deepest consternation. Almost 70 miles from Albany, Burgoyne decided to change his route. Rather than take boats down Lake George to reach the Hudson, he would go overland. It was a shorter route, but his troops would have to hack their own road out of the wilderness. When General Schuyler learned of Burgoyne's plans, he immediately put hundreds of his woodsmen to work. So he orders his troops to go out and start obstructing. They knock down all the bridges, they knock, cut trees across the roads. They make the British go at a snail's pace. And the strategy works. It took the British 20 days to cover just 22 miles. Burgoyne's army was now desperately short of supplies, especially for the cavalry. They brought with them a, a dismounted dragoon regiment German Dragoon Regiment, and this regiment was very keen to get horses so that it could become properly mobile. So a decision was taken to send out a small expedition to try and gather supplies, particularly get horses. The big problem Burgoyne faces is that his intelligence has missed the fact that there are two American officers out there in the direction that that column is headed. Seth Warner and John Stark two charismatic leaders, veterans of the French and Indian War, and really sharp tacticians. With that kind of leadership, the local militia is 10 times more potent a combat force than Burgoyne had ever thought it was. At three o'clock on the afternoon of August 16th, just west of Bennington, Vermont, Colonel John Stark and 1,500 New Hampshire militiamen surrounded the German and Loyalist positions. 
Stark, they say, pointed his sword at the enemy and shouted, There, my lads, are the Hessians. Tonight, our flag floats over yonder hill, or Molly Stark is a widow. The rebels charged. Their whole camp was in the utmost confusion and disorder. All their battalions were broken in pieces and fled. Our army made considerable slaughter amongst them. An American soldier. After two hours, the battle was over. More than 200 Germans lay dead. Another 700 were taken prisoner. Burgoyne had lost a tenth of his force, along with any hope of resupplying his troops from the countryside. But he was true to his word. This army would not retreat. The view of the enemy must be to get possession of Philadelphia. I shall keep close upon their heels and do everything in my power to make the project fatal to them. George Washington. Throughout the spring of 1777, George Washington and his army camped at Morristown, New Jersey to keep an eye on General Howe's army in New York. Washington reasoned that Howe would either take his huge fleet up the Hudson River to support General Burgoyne, or head south for the glory of capturing Philadelphia. In 18th century warfare, occupying the enemy capital meant victory. But Howe kept waiting for reinforcements from England. By the middle of July, he still had not made his move. The British commander was a cautious man. His rival, George Washington, was Howe's complete opposite. Washington was so impatient that portrait painters were said to have hated sessions with him because he couldn't sit still. On August 22nd, Howe's great fleet finally was sighted in the Chesapeake Bay. 15,000 British troops were now less than a week's march from Philadelphia. The next day, Washington rousted his army at four in the morning and set out to cut off Howe's advance. Wheel! By the right! Right! Yep. Right! Wheel! Yep. Left. A wealthy, young French aristocrat rode at Washington's side. The 19-year-old Marquis de Lafayette had hired his own ship to bring him to America and had volunteered to serve the rebel cause without pay. In return, Congress honored him with a commission in the Continental Army. Although Lafayette had never seen battle, the commander-in-chief had already come to depend on this teenage major general, nicknamed The Boy. Washington had no children of his own. He was old enough to be Lafayette's father. He may have seen in Lafayette the son that he had always wanted and never had. He may also have seen in Lafayette the type of person that he had been when he was 20 years old and soldiering on the frontier. Washington entrenched his army at Brandywine Creek across Howe's path of advance to Philadelphia. The creek was narrow but deep, a good natural obstacle, but not a perfect one. In defending at the Brandywine River, Washington is faced with a challenge. There are about eight crossing points along that river where the river can be forded easily by an army. So he's got to spread out and yet keep enough concentration so that he could actually defend one of them against a, a, an attack launched by Howe. Washington deployed his army along the shallow fords, 
He then asked some local farmers if there were any more crossings to protect. They said no. General Howe did his own reconnaissance and found they were wrong. While part of his force occupied the Americans at Chad's Ford, Howe meant to take the main body upstream, cross at an undefended ford, and strike Washington's army from behind. At 10.30 on the morning of September 11th, British cannon at Chad's Ford began pounding the American line. A skilled Scottish rifleman, Captain Patrick Ferguson, fixed an American officer in his sights. But Ferguson held his fire. He explained later, it was not pleasant to fire at the back of an unoffending individual who was acquitting himself very coolly of his duty. So I let him alone. The next day, Ferguson discovered that the officer he chose to spare was George Washington. About 11 o'clock, Washington began receiving contradictory reports. Two said the British were moving upstream. Another said they weren't. Washington chose to believe they weren't. But at 4.30, he heard the unmistakable thunder of artillery coming from his right. When Howe surprised the Americans at Long Island a year earlier, they had panicked and fled. This time, the rebels stood and fought the British toe-to-toe. -to -toe. What excessive fatigue. There was a most infernal fire of cannon and musketry. Incessant shouting, incline to the right, incline to the left, halt, charge. The balls plowing up the ground. The trees cracking over one's head. The leaves falling as in autumn by the grape shop. In the end, the Americans were overwhelmed. They reported twice as many casualties as the British. 1,300 men killed, lost, or wounded. The young Marquis de Lafayette, on his first day of battle, was shot in the leg. Howe's army was now just 25 miles from Philadelphia. Members of the Continental Congress prepared to abandon the city. They removed the Liberty Bell and all the records of the revolution. John Adams tried to reassure his wife, Abigail, who was in Boston. Don't be anxious for my safety. If Howe comes here, I shall run away, I suppose, with the rest. We are too brittle, you know, to stand the dashing of ball and bombs. On September 26th, the British occupied the American capital without firing a shot. A week later, reinforcements bolstered Washington's army, while Howe's was spread thin. At nightfall on October 3, 1777, Washington and four columns descended on the main British camp at Germantown, five miles from Philadelphia. At sunrise, the Americans attacked. They catch the lead British units in camp in very bad positions and overrun them. And absolutely panic one of the British Light Infantry Battalions, the best units the British had. And it, this appalls the Hessians who are serving with Howe because they say in their diaries, this is something nobody had ever seen before, a British unit fleeing in blind panic. 120 of the Redcoats took cover in a three-story house called the Chu Mansion. Nearly a 1,000 of Washington's men stopped to force them out. They shot at the mansion. They fired cannonballs at it. They even tried to burn it down, all to no avail. The delay broke the American momentum. 
Nearby, fog began to mingle with the smoke, obscuring friend and enemy alike. With only 30 yards visibility, two of Washington's columns fired at each other. Confused and panicked, they abandoned the field. And the promise of an American victory vanished in the mist. The Americans had lost another battle, but the French, who had been studying the rebels, decided Washington had at last proved himself. The critical thing from the French point of view is that having, quote, lost Brandywine, a couple of weeks later, Washington counterattacks. This to the French answers the big question that's been holding them back right along. Will the Americans stay the course? The French, looking at it very carefully, saw something extraordinary happening in the New World, which was that this colonial fragment, which they didn't think had any special significance, was merely part of the British Empire, had, as it were, suddenly come to life and had become involved in a struggle against Britain, France's enemy. And they were watching very carefully to see how do, did these people perform. Were they going to be suppressed like so many other rebellions or not? If the French would fight alongside them, the rebels were convinced the revolution could not fail. It seemed to them that all they needed to bring France into the war was one decisive victory. There is a hundred times more enthusiasm for the revolution in any Paris cafe than in the whole of the United States put together. French volunteer Louis Duportail. In the fall of 1777, an elderly, balding ladies' man from Philadelphia seduced a nation. 71-year-old Benjamin Franklin was already a sensation when he arrived in France. An inventor, scientist, philosopher, and author, he was so popular that people paid for a place just to watch his carriage go by. Armed with his incomparable wit and a portable printing press, Franklin waged a propaganda campaign to bring France officially into the war. He had to persuade one monarchy to help defeat another. There's a story that Jefferson tells about Franklin in Europe playing at chess with uh, an Austrian princess and uh, she announcing to him, I'm afraid, Mr. Franklin, that you have my king in check. Franklin responded, Madam, it will not be long before we'll have all your kings in check. In the fall of 1777, King George's strategy in North America was not going as planned. General John Burgoyne was still struggling down the Hudson in his campaign to split America in half but his expedition had already lost a thousand men. In mid-September, less than 40 miles from his goal of Albany, Burgoyne, with 6,000 regulars, crossed the Hudson at Saratoga. His path was blocked by 6,000 American troops, strongly entrenched at Bemis Heights, and now under the command of Horatio Gates. The cautious 50-year-old general was affectionately called Granny Gates by his men. His rival, Burgoyne, called him that old midwife. Gates had been joined by the legendary rifleman Daniel Morgan. Morgan was more than six feet tall. He had a reputation as the rowdiest rum drinker and toughest fighter on the Virginia frontier. He organized a company of riflemen for service in the Continental troops. 
And these were riflemen from the Virginia frontier who were crack shots. And they began to practice and people came to see them and the press reported the absolutely remarkable uh, skill. And it was a little bit rem reminiscent of the, of the story of William Tell uh, in Switzerland, the national hero who could shoot an, an apple with his bow off the, his son's head. These men shot apples off the heads of their friends. They were that good. On September 19th, near the American camp at Bemis Heights, Morgan's riflemen were ready for a fight. They soon found one. The Redcoats advanced. For three hours, Gates did nothing. Finally, at noon, he sent out Daniel Morgan's riflemen. They were driven back by the main body of the British. Using tactics borrowed from the Indians, Morgan now positioned his men throughout the woods, even in the trees. Eleven more American regiments, 4,000 men, swarmed across Freeman's farm. Such an explosion of fire I never had any idea of before. And the heavy artillery, like great peals of thunder, almost deafened us. Lieutenant William Digby. By dusk, Burgoyne held the field, but at a cost of nearly 700 men, a third of his soldiers who fought that day. That night, the Americans began a harassing fire that would continue for days. During the night, we remained in our ranks, and though we heard the groans of our wounded and dying, could not assist them. Sleep was a stranger to us. Lieutenant William Digby. There has been a great noise like the howling of dogs on the right of our encampment. It proved to have arisen from large droves of wolves that came after the dead bodies. Lieutenant Thomas Anbury. Still refusing to retreat, Burgoyne, on October 7th, led 1,500 of his best troops toward the American line at Bemis Heights. The British were outnumbered more than two to one. Burgoyne ordered a withdrawal, but the aide sent to deliver this message was shot. The fighting went on. After quarreling with General Gates, Benedict Arnold had been removed from command. In the American camp, Arnold now listened to the sounds of battle a mile and a half away and fumed. Arnold, of course, could never get along with his superiors or his uh, subordinates. Right out from the very beginning, he couldn't get along with Gates, and Gates couldn't get along with him. Gates didn't want to admit that Arnold was as important as he was because Arnold was a pain in the neck. Determined to fight, with or without permission, Arnold spurred his horse toward the gunfire. He led the Americans in a furious assault on the British and Germans, who were falling back. Benedict Arnold had his horse shot out from under him and was shot in the leg, the same leg broken by a British musket ball at Quebec two years before. Burgoyne's army was decimated. 600 troops killed, wounded, or captured. Captain John Henry, son of the fiery orator Patrick Henry, had fought his last battle. When the battle was over, John Henry walked across the battlefield and 
uncovered the faces of many of the young men who he knew who had died in the battle. It apparently had such an effect upon him that he threw down his sword and he fell to wailing and crying out right on the battlefield. And about two months later, he resigned his commission and returned home to Virginia, unwilling to fight ever again. At sundown on October 8th, Burgoyne did what he swore he'd never do, retreat. It was too late. As his beaten soldiers headed toward safety, the rebels moved to cut them off. We were finally obliged to take refuge in a cellar. My children laid down with their heads upon my lap, and in this manner we passed the entire night a horrible stench, the cries of the children, and yet more than all this, my own anguish prevented me from closing my eyes. Baroness von Riedesel. At the village of Saratoga, Burgoyne was surrounded. Over the next three days, in two councils of war, his officers urged him to surrender. Finally, on October 15th, Burgoyne accepted the unacceptable. On October 17th, the sun came out for the first time in nine days. Burgoyne had been wearing the same clothes for two weeks, in spite of bullet holes in his hat and waistcoat. To surrender his army, he changed to his finest scarlet uniform. General Burgoyne saluted his conqueror and said, the fortune of war, General Gates, has made me your prisoner. As the British soldiers began to surrender their arms, the American soldiers sympathetically averted their eyes. About 10 o'clock we marched out with drums beating. But the drums seemed to have lost their former inspiriting sounds. It was almost a shame to be heard on such an occasion. Lieutenant William Digby. Among the 5,000 prisoners were seven generals and a dozen members of parliament. Gates wrote to his wife, if old England is not by this lesson taught humility, then she's an obstinate old slut bent upon her ruin. The news of Burgoyne's surrender shocked London. Upon hearing it, the King's Prime Minister, Lord North, sat speechless for hours. As 1777 ended, England had lost an army and a chance to win the war. Now, with Britain wounded, her old enemies, France and Spain, were poised to strike. This colonial rebellion, begun in a New England village, was about to become a world war. <laughs> 